they're 6'5 or 6'6, six, six, <laughs> right? They're still this big. Um, I have other stories I can share, but they'll be later. So the title today was, was Message, because as I've already shared with you, this one is basically pointed at the men, basically, but not entirely. Not entirely at all, because there's things I'm going to share in here for those that, the ladies that are here, um, not just me, but statistically speaking to basically any man that I've ever been around. We would want you to know, but we would never tell you. So we're going to talk about that too. Well, we're going to study a story that, that, that Jesus told from the book of Luke. We're going to study that too, and I'm going to share with you a, a real life story. Something that literally happened just a few years ago. So it's Dad's Day. It's Man Day, right? And you ladies, I actually had a slide prepared for this I didn't do that said, well, what else is new? Right? <laughs> See, I knew you good ladies are going to point on Like, what else is new? It's like your day, right? I mean, but okay, so we can laugh about that. And today is a day to celebrate. But as I've already said, for some of you, that's just amazing. For some of you, Father's Day is like, let's just get it over with. I'd rather talk about something else. So today, I want to challenge the men. Why? I'm going to show you something as to why. Because biblically speaking, it is not hard to find, it is incredibly easy to find, that God holds us men to a higher standard. We are to a standard that is incredibly high. It is huge. And I am just going to go out on a limb here to say that we are supposed to step up. But that many, and I would even say most, men simply want to slide by. And today, I'm going to just tell it like it is. Okay? This is man's day, but you didn't come here for me to pamper your hind end. Because that ain't going to happen. And here's why. <coughs> you this slide? 3.5% of a family, 3.5% of a family gets saved if your child is saved first. So in other words, not a whole lot of influence, Junior. 17% of the family gets saved if mom gets saved first. Much better than the child, but still, are we listening to mom? 93%, 93% of a family will be, of every member of that family will be saved if the man is saved first. I don't have to say anything else. <coughs> now, that statistic goes for Christian beliefs and his followings and what a man chooses to do with his life, but I'm going to tell you right now, that's pretty much the percentage for most decisions in a family. Now, I'm not saying 100% because I know all families are different and I won't go there. But for the most part, if dad believes it and teaches it and wants it, 93% are going to follow. 93% of the time it's going to follow. If the kid wants to do it, eh. If mom wants to do it, and I'm not saying that's, a fa that's fair, ladies. I'm not saying that's fair. I'm just saying that's real. That's not my statistic. Men, how real, how real is it that we step up? How real is it? I'm, I started a few years ago, and some of you have heard me talk about it before, my black books. You know, black books used to be, when I was a kid, if you heard about a black book, they were like the numbers that all of your, like the, your lady friends' the numbers are written in, I think. That's what they always said. Not mine. Your pastor's got two black books. I finished one. And I started the second one. And these are just things that I come across in my life that I write down that I want my kids to know when I'm not here. Because one day I won't be here. And in the in front of both of them, the other one has it the same way I wrote this. I copied it. It says, if you really want to get to know the core of who people really are, get them to start talking about their dad. Let them tell you what he said to them. Things he modeled for them. It will be very telling as to why they are who they are. If they are being transparent, they will often be fighting back tears. Either because they loved and admired their father so much, or because he deeply wounded them in some way. I 
wrote that in my books because I want that. I always want to remember that. In everything that I write in that book, in the things that I do in my life, I want to remember those two outcomes. Will they cry because they love me or will they cry because I wounded them? So, here are some male things. You remember I shared some female things on Mother's Day about our brains and our way of doing things that are just the way we are. I will share this one again because remember, ladies, when the, when the fetus was just weeks old and God had determined male or female, if it was a male baby, you remember what happened? Yeah. Yeah. Testosterone literally eats the brain away. <laughs> you like that, don't you? It separates the right and left lobes of the brain so they don't work together very well. So we're, men are pretty focused. You gotta love us, right? We cannot multitask. Our brains don't operate that way. Estrogen, on the other hand, makes those two sides work better. It makes them complement each other. So you ladies can use both sides of your brain at the same time, and you don't understand why we're only half brain. We literally are most of the time. I'm telling you right now. We just don't go back and forth very well. Okay? But I will say this. You ladies have more cones in your eyes, so I told you that you see more colors than we do. You do. You literally see more colors than we do. But men are the champions at focused vision. And I say champions because I'm trying to give us some compliments here. <laughs> if we are looking at something or doing something, we are focused. That's why you cannot interrupt us. Because if you change our focus, we're done. We're done. If you, if you say, did you hear that? I'll say, if I'm over here, I'm like, no, well, hear what? And, you're, and you will not understand why I can't do it when they say, I cannot do that. Which one would you like me to focus on? Now, a little tip, guys, which is a good and bad, once I learned this, if Julie asks me to look for something, or more likely, if I say, have you seen this? And she says, honey, why don't you go look? Okay, and I go. I try to remember what color it is. I'm serious. Because then I focus, I know I'm gonna focus. So instead of looking for a hacksaw, I remember my hacksaw was red. And I look for something red. Because if I'm looking for a hacksaw in everything, I can't find it. But if I look for something red, I can find it. Here's the problem. If it's orange, I'm done. <laughs> because I'll go back up and say, oh, okay. and she'll go down and she'll walk up with it. And I'll say, where'd you find the orange one? Right? <clears throat> we focus, but we're, but we're horrible at other things. But we, we are the champions of focus. We do focus well, and you got to love us, I hope. The only other thing I will share with you ladies today about us men, and I, I guess it's a quality, it's a good thing. We like our nothing place, okay? I know ladies don't have such a nothing place because your brains are always working at the same time, and you got a gazillion things, and you got ten things going, and our focus may go on our nothing place. You know that little storage drawer a guy might have on his workbench that does, has nothing in it? Sometimes we like that place. We like to do nothing. We just want to go and do nothing. And you don't understand why we don't want to die. See, I, I, see, I get the privilege of seeing all your faces. And this is the process. Because you ladies. Uh, <laughs> but why are you telling them, man? Because it's true, right? We have that nothing place. But there's more later, and I promise, guys, it gets better at the end. Okay? So I want to cover a couple of father stories today. But they're not just for fathers. Because we have a huge male, we have huge male influences in your life. I heard this one time when I was a young man, and I thought, wow, it's one of those things. I was kind of through that stage, but I remembered this. And I've actually shared this with some men that have come into Luke's life, because Luke is at that stage right now. But the male influences, the male influences in a young man's life when he first leaves home are huge for the rest of his life. Now... He can make better choices. I get that. But if he is in contact with adult male influences that are good and strong, and I will add godly, when he leaves my presence, that will affect his life in a tremendous way. 
The same thing goes if he's out of my realm of teaching and he steps into an adult male's influence that is not good, he will learn from that too. It's huge. So I am going to challenge you men to say, if there's a young man that comes into your life that is out of the influence of his father, what's he learning from you? What's he learning from you? You have to answer that question. I can't. So the first story this morning is from the book of Luke. I won't go into a lot of explanation, but I think we should because when I was when I was in church, nobody explained to me anything about the books of the Bible. It's the books of the Bible, right? It's the books of the Bible. It's the book of Luke. Well, Luke actually <coughs> followed Paul. Luke was a physician. Luke was very well educated, and Luke wrote his book to a man called Theophilus. You could read it in the first chapter, okay? He wrote it to a fellow Gentile believer, and he was writing to him to give a specific account to Theophilus so Theophilus could then take that and teach other people. He wanted Theophilus to know what Jesus represented and to best represent the stories that Luke had learned from so many believers through the years. That's the reason you have the book of Luke. Luke did not walk with Jesus, but Luke walked with the people who walked with Jesus. And he was educated enough to say, you know what, I studied all this, and here's the truth. Most excellent Theophilus. Okay? That's what the book of Luke was. So, we're going to start with Luke. In this 15th chapter, for the setup, you, will, you would read, if you went back to the beginning, that there are tax collectors and sinners that are gathering to listen to Jesus. That's nothing new. We've heard that forever, forever, right? Tax collectors and sinners are around Jesus, and the Pharisees hated it. They hated it because they didn't want Jesus spreading his, his stuff all around. So, because these people were there, Jesus, Luke shares, Jesus told them these stories. Plural. Stories. He told them three in a row. So I'm not just going to share one of them with you. I have to share the details of one. I can't share the details of three. The tax collectors and sinners are all around Jesus. The Pharisees are there going, man, what are you doing again? And Jesus says, I'm going to tell you some stories. And he tells them the first story. The first story he shares with them is about lost sheep. Y'all remember that story? Right? A man has one sheep and it's lost. One he bought. Okay. Lost, lost sheep. Story number one. And then Jesus goes into story number two. The woman with the lost coin. Remember that story? Okay. She loses a coin. There's a theme here. Lost sheep. Lost coin. And then he goes into... Our parable for today, which we call the prodigal son, but it's a son that was lost. Do we see the theme that Jesus set up for these people that day? Lost sheep, lost coins, and our lost son. Because we're going to talk today about lost things. That's what Jesus was talking about. He had the Pharisees there. He had the sinners and the tax collectors there. And he proceeded to tell them three stories in a row about lost things. So, we're not going to read every verse because I, would, I, I could just really get lost in that. But we're going to read a few of the verses. So we're going to start, obviously, with the beginning, verses 11 and 12. To illustrate the point. Now, if I just started there, you said, just illustrate what point? To illustrate what point? To illustrate the point that we have lost things, right? We have the lost sheep, and we have lost coins. And then Jesus said to illustrate the point, or, or, or Luke wrote, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story, a third story. Yeah. A man had two sons, so he's a father. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Wow. That's not a very cheerful thing for your son to come and say, is it? <laughs> Hey, Dad, pony up. <laughs> I, want, I want it now. I don't want to wait till you die. Give me everything now. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now, you have to realize, in our culture, that's a slap in the face, right? I mean, really? Did you just ask me for, for your inheritance, and I'm still alive? In the Eastern culture, that would have sent a gasp through the room. In their culture... Our culture is incredibly uh, naive to what they, how they looked at their relationship with their children. That's the reason that there's not any stories about a man with his daughters. Because they had no value in their culture. 
and Jesus walked into that culture and changed that. But his stories have to be real to their culture. In their culture, the fact that this youngest son, did you notice that? Read the Old Testament. Who had all the power? The oldest son. He got everything. So Jesus not only says that the kids are asking for their money ahead of time, but it's the nerve of the youngest one to ask me. You, we have to see how incredible this was in their time because we read right over that. And we don't think anything about it. And it was a big, big deal. So, not yet, Jack. I'm going to get to the rest. Uh, so here's what, it, then what happens. A few days later, a few days after this, his father has divided the estate. This younger son leaves. Now, did he have it planned? I've heard different sermons on that. I don't know about that. We're not getting into that. But he leaves. He goes to a far off land for some wild living. Use your imagination. <laughs> In that world, there's a famine that begins. And this young man has already squandered his inheritance. And he is starving to death. So he asks a local farmer for a job. The local farmer says, wonderful, go feed the pigs. Does anybody in here know what a pig meant to the Jewish culture? I think most of us do. So there you go, kid. You ran off, and now you're feeding pigs. Are you kidding me? You're feeding pigs. And to make it worse, he says, that food actually started to look good to you. So you're licking the wrapper of the Snickers bar because you left home and have already squandered your money. You're eating, and you think that pig's food looks good. So then our Bible say he came to his senses. That's a whole sermon in itself. Whole sermon in itself. He came to his senses. And he went home. And then we get to verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, think about that. A long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He finally figured it out. He finally got it. And if we jump back into the culture of that day, the father, he was the youngest son, and he had made him look like a fool. The father could have cared less if he came home. He made me look like a fool. I don't care if he comes home. He's the youngest anyway. The oldest son is still here with me. He's lost to me. He's dead to me. In that culture, Jesus tells this parable that the father saw him coming from a long way off. The father was watching. The father understood. The father had forgiven and was filled with love for this son that this culture could have cared less about. So, of course, in the dynamics of any family, the son asks his father, just take me back as a servant. You don't have to take me back as your son. I've just done so many things wrong. As long as I'm a servant, I'll be happy. And then the dynamic enters in that is so true in all of our lives. Da, da, da. The other son enters in. Hey, Dad, don't you remember me? Right? Don't you remember me? You, you're going to serve up this fattened calf. You're going to celebrate because he returned? I am just a wee bit upset, Pops, that this whole thing has taken place like it has. Because I have been here the whole time. I have done everything you asked. And you haven't given me anything, which is actually a lie, but I don't have time to get into that. No way, Dad. You couldn't have done that to me. And then Jesus finishes the parable this way. His father said to him, the older son, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything, everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Now, I don't even begin to tell you that I understand that verse completely because I think I do and then I see it in a new way and I know that I don't. But what I do understand is that there's a whole lot more symbolism in that than just a kid coming home and dad patting him on the back saying, welcome home, kid. Why does he mention death and life? I mean, the kid just came home. He wasn't dead. Jesus 
intermingles such spiritual significance into our own life that it's incredible. So I'm going to ask you if you know that very last sentence. He was lost, but now he is found. And I'm going to specifically ask you men if you know that verse. Because I really seriously doubt that there's a man sitting in this room right now that hasn't been lost. I know I have. We've been lost, fellas, and it's not something that we like to share. We'll change the subject and talk about football. We'll change the subject and we'll talk about the weather. My mower broke down. I want to talk about something else, but I want to tell you I was lost. I want to talk about that. We've been lost. But there were three things that happened with that father in that parable. And he started off with the fact that he cared and that he loved and that he forgave as he went through that time in his life he cared the son came home he could have disowned him he could have said who are you he, said, he could have said go eat some more pods there kiddo but how are the piggies but he loved and he forgave and in the end when he had rebellion in his home, he gave direction. Not only to the son that came back, but also to the one that was there that felt like he'd gotten gypped in the whole deal. Did you see how he walked through that time, fellas, in one parable that I had to go way too fast? He cared because he divided his inheritance. He loved them, he forgave them, and in the end, he gave them direction. So my question to you men in the crowd this morning is, are you? Are you doing those things in your life? Are you proving that you care? Are you loving and forgiving? And are you allowing for your family to go in the direction that God would want you to go? <clears throat> If there's a voice in your ear right now, it's not mine. I have a true story from our world to share this morning, too. It's a true story about a football coach. His name was Lou Little. And he wrote a memoir after he had finished coaching, and he shared this story. And in some ways, it's very hard for me to share a story like this. In a lot of ways, it was. <clears throat> because through those years, Mr. Little, Coach Little, had... Obviously, hundreds of young men on his and on his football teams. And he remembered one young man specifically. He said he was a second stringer. You know what that means, guys. He didn't make a cut with the first team. He was there for practice, tackle dummy. You know. But he was a good kid. And the coach noticed that this young man's father visited the campus quite a bit more than most fathers did. And in recalling the years that he had seen this, he remembered that he would see this young man and his father often arm in arm as the, as the son walked around the campus and pointed out things to his father. And then one day the young man came into Coach Little's office and he said, Coach, I need a few practices off. I need to go home a couple days. He said, my dad's passed away. And I need to go home for the funeral. Well, of course, the coach said, sure, kid, take all the time you need. But the kid came back with a little bit of boldness, and he came into the coach's office, and he says, coach, I want to start the next game. <laughs> coach said, kid, you're second string at best, man. You're not starting for my team. No way. Absolutely not. I'm sorry you lost your dad. It doesn't make you a better football player. But the young man was relentless, begging the coach and telling him, if you have one reason at all, any reason during that game to take me out, take me out, but let me start that game. Just one game. So finally, Coach Little consented. And he said, okay. He put the kid in the game and he watched him because he just knew he was going to mess up or he was going to get hurt. 
That kid absolutely played his heart out. Coach said I was amazed at what that young man did. And the entire coaching staff agreed that he was the best player on the field. Best player on the field. So after the game, Coach Little looks him up and he said, hey, he said, I bet you did that for your dad, didn't you? The young man's answer. He said, Coach, you had no way of knowing this, but my dad was blind. Tonight, tonight was the first game he ever actually got to see me play. He actually got to watch me tonight. So yes, yes, I did it for my father. So men, I hope that you cannot sit there now and wonder about this in your life. What's your influence? I guarantee you it runs deeper and wider than you have at any time. And if you're like me, that scares the bejeebers out of you. That ought to scare you to death. It's an incredible gift and an incredible responsibility. So now I ask you, will you lead in your life with grace and truth? Or will you lead in your life with power and turmoil? It's your choice. Grace and truth or power and turmoil. Like this young man's father, maybe we should blind ourselves to our ways in order to lead in God's ways. Because if you're anything like me, sometimes those come head to head and you have a choice to make. And at one time in my life, that was a decision I had to make, and anymore it's not. Is it God's ways or my ways? Don't tell me the answer, tell him. So I'll close with this as I go back to the statistics in our lives. Men's number one need, ladies and kids, is respect. Respect, that's why I talked to the young men that came forward this morning for the children's story. We do want respect, but it needs to be earned. It cannot be demanded. It is desired, it is craved, and it is needed. And it comes with many, many faces. And I have seen this, and you have too, that a man, a man will destroy many things, including his home, his life, and his marriage, in search of respect. He may not deserve it, but he desires it. So men, to you, if you desire it, which I know you do, live a life that deserves it. Because ladies and children, a man must find it in his home. A man must find it in his home. After he has earned it, and after he has received it, then it's our time to offer it. Because as in the story that Jesus shared so eloquently from years ago about being lost, <clears throat> fathers, we are to care. We are to love. We are to live a life where we lead in forgiveness and where we offer a direction that the world is not. As a believer, you should live it. And you should show it. If you are lost and you are looking for a God and his home, you are in that story today. Ask him. And if you are a critic of my faith, if you are a critic of the way that I choose to live my life, I would wonder about the destruction in your life as you look for what only God can offer. It's our choice. So men, will we go out and will we live like men? Or will we live like grown-up little boys? Will you pray? 
Our God and our Father, we have a challenge today as we share around our country the men that have been in our lives. And Father, some of those men are no longer with us. Some we cherished and some challenged us and, and some, some damaged us in many ways. But today is a day to reflect. Today is a day to look at the men and see what we represent. For those men in, in this audience that listen, for those in this sanctuary that listen, what do we see when we look in the mirror? Are we caring? Are we loving and forgiving? And do we provide direction worth following? Father, I pray for you to speak into the lives of those men here today that need that. Help us to come together to lead and to follow when necessary, but to always follow your light as we share this life together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.